Welcome back to the Alts Podcast. I'm your host, Horatio Ruiz. We bring you industry leaders and creators to give their insights on the rapidly changing and exciting world of alternative assets. Opinions expressed on this podcast by the host and podcast guests are for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Podcast hosts and guests may maintain positions in the offerings discussed in this podcast. Today's guest is Laura Ten Eyck, the director of the Second Floor Gallery at their Go See Bookstore, one of the most fabled in Manhattan. Laura is an antiquarian map dealer, vice president of the New York Map Society, and a regular guest on the PBS Antiques Roadshow. Today we get into all sorts of stuff, what makes maps valuable and collector's items, how map collecting has just changed in the last 20 years, and the current trends she sees in the industry. Laura voices her support for the fractional space because she says fractionalization happens quite often among map dealers. So we'll pick it up as we start discussing the 1796 plan for New York City, a map that will be IPO'd on Riley Road in the near future. I hope you enjoyed my awesome conversation with Laura Ten Eyck. You actually hit it on the head there, uh, Laura, as far as like um, it, it, a lot of it is community driven. Um, a lot of it feels like, you know, you have a community like in social media, like I own a piece of this map or I own a piece of this NFT and people come together and they're excited about that. So it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, I would think about, oh, that can work with an NFT because it's digital. But but mm-hmm. I think, you know, oh, a Maverick map of New York City, it's so rare. It's so special. Wouldn't the owner want to just have it up and enjoy it? But I like this idea of, of participation about, you know, everyone banding together to get it because yeah. like it's telling you that's exactly what dealers do you know map dealers are very unique it's a very niche world as you know well i can tell you more about it later um so that these really special pieces don't come up that often and when they do it can there can be a, what's called a ring right? so several dealers buy it together and they all try to sell it together some people say they disclose that information some dealers say oh we own it in the group and some people don't they want it to be you know very like on the quiet um so it's sort of interesting to just say take it to the public why can't a group own it you know but generally collectors are so passionate about maps they don't want to share with anyone else that's kind of the (laughs) the situation so fractionalizing does not appeal but when it's something that there's when there's only one and there's no other own it's kind of a cool idea i'd like to kind of start and you know about your role you're you are you are the gallery director at our gosi bookstore our gosi is one of the you know the famous bookstores in new york city uh has uh, a great history how did you get involved? And, and well, actually, before that, what do you do as gallery director at Argosi? <laughs> well, my job is so nuanced. There's no real job description for it. And and one thing I often tell people when I when I introduce myself and I say that I'm an antiquarian map dealer, it stops the conversation dead. Mostly, they've never met one before, and they can't <laughs> imagine what the job entails. So it, it's a unique micro part of the art world it is part of the art world it is part of the antiquarian book world but it really is on its own it's 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 a branch of art collecting because some maps are like artworks but it's completely on its own so there's no like university course or classes you can take to be a map dealer i learned through an apprenticeship way back I've, I've worked here at the RBC bookstore for uh, about 22 years wow. and, and it's a long time but it's just such an incredible job there's no other equivalent there's no better job I've been headhunted and things like that but I, I couldn't accept the jobs because nothing's as cool as what I have and and what I had is that the gallery is in the bookstore in the town Manhattan and the store is 100 years old and it has not changed. It's it's the same old bookstore. It's family owned. I'm not in the family, so I'm, I'm a staff here. And when I started, I did an apprenticeship. I had a one-year work permit to live in the States. I'm, I'm Canadian. And um, so when they hired me, I said, well, I'm, I'm interested in this job from an art background because I'm trained as an artist. I'm trained as a, a printmaker. Mm-hmm. And I was interested in the way that maps were made. And they said, oh, have you ever worked with maps and, and, or, and prints? And I hadn't. And my experience was with contemporary art and, and sculpture and printing. So, um, I, so it was an apprenticeship. And this is back in, you know, 1999 when people couldn't Google things. Yeah. You had to know by looking. 
And that's exactly what I did. I, I spent thousands of hours looking at objects and that informed me that helped me tell the difference between you know an engraving an etching a mezzotint hand coloring handmade coloring original coloring new coloring and, and it's really through looking that that you that the was part of the trade and then I feel that most antiquarian map dealers are like that they they've there's no training it's hands-on what was it about maps that kind of just drew you in i mean is it the the history is it i know you said you had an art background the art behind it what is it that appealed to you well it's a little bit of everything with maps because it's an aesthetic experience you're looking at them but there's they're not subjective you know how sometimes art in art world an art can be intimidating or very subjective to the point where you say, "Well, I don't like blue, so I don't like that painting." Whereas yeah. maps, there's always there's always a threshold or a point of entry for everyone. They might look at it and say, "Well, I I really want to know what it looked like where where I'm from." Or I really want to know where I'm going. I'm going on a trip, and and it can involve a lot of fantasy. There's a lot of armchair travel involved with generating map production in the 18th century and and now like the, the the fantasy that comes through looking at a beautiful map is is something that is is it's an experience that you can you can't really do with an artwork so that appealed to me and and also the fact that it's so niche it's so obscure and, and it's just it's a place that it falls in between the worlds the book world and and i i liked that it appealed to me and i, I basically fell in love with maps back when I did the apprenticeship and, and I'm still learning after all this time, I'm still discovering things I've never seen before. And that's what makes every day so special. You described the, the art of it, the, the beauty of the arts and kind of the maps and kind of how they can maybe whisk your way into something else. Do you ever get any inquiries from researchers even to see how, you know, maybe certain cartographers saw a certain landmass or anything like that, how they maybe saw what they were exploring in a different way? and how that might have you know informed their decisions at the time well i certainly have scholars come and research but it's it's more on the level of not the way land masses looked or changed over time it's more of a genealogy focus it's more of a of a what were the names used and why you know mm -hmm. where was the information coming from was it indigenous information was it french was it you know there's, there's so much um manipulation with map making people don't realize that they think when they look at maps they think it's true or the truth but in fact it, they can often be persuasive or or they're trying to convey the opinions of the map maker be it french french or english or dutch or whoever's whoever's producing the map has the, you know the hidden agenda of making land masses different shapes or, or maybe manipulating the audience to think, well, would the French French territory look bigger? So I think that when people are looking for maps, they're interested in, in place names, mostly. Okay, really cool. Like, you're basically saying that it was used as propaganda in some regards. You There's know. so much propaganda with mapping. And, and we, we're taught when we're kids, like, hopefully not as much now. They need more geography in schools. But, you know, you have that. There's that all encompassing authority of the map as being truth and the true vision of the way the world looks and we now know that you know that that can be any vision it can be upside down it can be the you know the the controversy of the mercator projection and and how it was revolutionary in in the 17th century but what it what it did was it it distorted the way the world looks you know so so it's like trying to make a globe a round object flat is a mathematical challenge, as you know, and, and it ends up with distortion. All maps are distorted to a certain degree, and, and it can work in your favor, you know, in terms of what you want to present as a country. So interesting. You also mentioned that it's a niche. Maps are a niche for collectors, maybe investors, but it is quite an industry, right? I mean, there are some very serious uh, map collectors. Uh, how has the map, quote unquote, game changed over the last, say, 20 years? Um, and do you see it kind of uh, rising in popularity or has it kind of stayed the same since when you started? Well, uh, interesting question. I mean, certainly there was what we call a market interruption with, how can I put it, the sort of, uh, they, with the rise of the collectible. So that means what I'm talking about is eBay, Etsy, First Dibs, um, uh, Catawiki, comp uh, organizations like that where there's suddenly like there's online auctions and there's no more authority. The authority is the dealers almost put to the wayside 
and it became like a place where people dumped material. So um, the nature of maps are such that they are in their multiples. So no longer could you say that, oh, uh, you know, a map by Ortelius, which was printed, printed in 1570. So, so old, so incredible. But now because of the way that the marketplaces with, with the, the online auctions, now people can see, oh, how rare is this when I can see 10 copies available of exactly the same map online? So it kind of decreased the value of certain types of maps, not by a lot, but it, it changed the marketplace. And, and that was good and bad because what it made, it made the uh, uh, material more accessible. So suddenly you realize I, I can buy a map that's a hundred, hundreds and hundreds of year, years old for a few hundred dollars. But then you could see that maybe it wasn't so rare. So, so it's what's the difference between rare, unique, special, antique, all these terms that we used to use to, to market. We used to say, oh, it's very rare no other version known but then of course the nature of they're printed they're engraved there were thousands printed and then it becomes a game of how many are left in the world and that can drive the price so after that market adjustment what happened was people started to lean towards uniqueness so for example was it hand done is it a manuscript map or opening up other markets like what we found in the trade was that like if you look at, say, maps that were in Korean, Japanese, or Chinese, were not really traded in the Western markets. And, and, and so after this sort of like eBay dumping, people started to look to other things. What, where else can we go to get special material? And um, things like when the, when the Louvre opened, in the, the friend, when the Louvre opened in, in Abu Dhabi, in, in the United Arab Emirates, it, it was... It was a way they needed material, like they wanted other material. They were, what, you know, were there any maps that were Arabic or, or you know, other than like Latin, Dutch, French, or English? So, so there was a new market emerging from that initial trade, which I think is exciting because it became, you know, let's look at other material. Let's let's think about what you know. Are are Korean maps even oriented? Is there a north south? Are there even directions on those maps? And and I feel like that's the, where the market's going like right now is people looking for other voices. Yeah, it, you know, the more I, I interview uh, experts from across different, um, you know, industries, the, the more the stories are kind of the same, you know, because we cover a lot of sports cards. And so, you know, you've had older sports cards, the, the traditional, you know, 1950 two tops, you know, uh, 1948 Bowman's any, anyway, these are like old baseball cards yeah. and they've had their time and they're, they, they are, they are the, the blue chip, right. But as these cards have had their run up, people are looking at towards other, other uh, avenues to create more value for themselves. Right. Because, you know, now wrestling cards, right. So it's just funny how it works just in different oh, ways. Thing, yeah. Which is more theater, more mm -hmm. other, more like more art involved in, in, the production of it rather than like the data of sports oh yeah. interesting yes i mean you i think you know we can see that like the other thing that happened is in terms of the trade or market there was a look at newer maps you know we used to say like when i first started say like say 2000 2001 we weren't interested in maps made in the 1970s that was too new and and now what we see is what you know people are interested again like someone like you know tharp where she she so there were there were no maps of the ocean floor right they didn't map it until like the 60s and it was technology it was the marine vessels with the sonar that could actually map the ocean floor so it, it's it's shocking that they never did it of course they could do gorgeous sea charts in the 17th century on how to get from you know how to get from spain to to the caribbean this is different oh this is looking at what's underneath wow and that's leading to all kinds of technology, you know, open, like ocean floor mining and, and, you know, fishing and all that kind of stuff. But um, Marie Tharp, her maps, a lot of her maps from the 1970s are just going through the roof in value, but not through the roof in, in the high end. Like you can buy these things for under a thousand, but, you know, they weren't even marketable 10 years ago. 
no one wanted it. Like it wasn't the people like, oh, it's it's too, it's too new, it's too graphic, it's too scientific. Yeah, it's artsy enough. But now people are like, wait a minute, a female did it, and she like she wasn't even allowed on the marine vessel because I think it was like bad luck or something. So, so you know, it's sort of like it's those are going up in value. I have in New York City in my gallery. I always try to have subway maps. And, you know, maps from the 1970s are eight and $900. These are subway maps, right? Yeah. And that's, that's not big money, but it, it's something that was, it's fresh, it's new. People come in asking for it. You have the MoMA collecting that in their design department. And, you know, you have the MTA phasing out the printed map. They have those horrible digital maps in the subway and they're really just so ugly. So, so, so people are nostalgic for even maps from the 90s, right? Of, of the beautiful, <laughs> crisp, printed maps that were of the top quality and color so we're seeing a lot of that and it's fun because it's fresh again you have to stay fresh in the industry and you have to keep up and it's been very hard to keep up with everything in the past two years it's been hard to acquire material obviously because a lot of the times we would do the RBC bookstore we would go to homes we would go to someone's house and buy all of their book collections and then often in the book collections there would be a box of maps and I would get all those in my apartment. So I didn't actively go buy it. The bookstore did, but I get them all. And, and so, you know, I, we weren't doing that. We're doing, doing home buying or anything like that during the pandemic. And then there were no map fairs. There were no book fairs. So it's been hard uh, in that way to get material. I love it when uh, objects that have been discarded or overlooked for years, right? Decades. Like you mentioned those, uh, the, 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 the seafloor maps and uh and then for one reason or another they they get like they gain value because people begin to appreciate them they see the the you know how important they are yeah i mean someone like say buckminster fuller he was an inventor and he invented the dimaxion projection so it was an alternative map and it was kind of he's i mean of course he's an icon but his maps were not like they were they were in poster form he did some limited edition silk screens and those are impossible to get and then they sell like in the 10 to fifteen thousand dollar range but even just his limited edition posters were just a few hundred and now you can't even buy them you know and, and again it's looking yeah. at the way the world looks in a different way yeah. and and that's what's appealing to people now so it's it's kind of fun to be able to keep up to it and and i mean you know i still you know of course we still everyone still loves like a classic like i'm thinking the mercator hondius arctic it, it's 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 artsy it's got mythology, it's got technology, it's got everything in there. It's from around 1606. So, so, wow. and it sells for, let's say four or $5,000. So it's, it's, it's accessible. It's still, it's a lot for a little sheet of paper, but yeah. they're often available, not all the time, but so that's a classic. That's never going to be a fashion. How many copies of those were made, for example, in, six, in the 1600s? Thousands were printed, but no one's really done an analysis of how many are circulating. So, you know, um, in terms of value, you can look at like how many are for sale, how many auction records are there, how many institutional copies are there. These are methods and strategies we use when we're coming up with pricing, you know, and, and of course, every single dealer's dream come true, map dealer is finding something they've never seen before yeah and that is that's exciting because suddenly you can throw whatever price on it you want you can you can just say try to find another one no institutional copy no you know so so these are the things that we all love to find out about and and then it becomes a game like what's the real value behind it what we call a one of one one of one, and, yeah. or is you know, and, and these things have a way of coming out. Like it, when we, you know, when we find something rare and we describe it and we put it out there on our website, it's always kind of scary because you think like, it, it, what if it sells in an hour? Did I price it wrong? You know, or mm -hmm. like, what if suddenly another one comes out and they just match your price? So suddenly you've done all the legwork on the research, and then they're just <laughs> following your price, and now there's two. So is it worth as much? So yeah. there's all kinds of games that that people play and and I mean I think the other thing I wanted to talk about with the market adjustment was we, what we saw was the the rise of the auction house the powerful the one who dictates all the prices and who buys what and that's something that came out as well like 
2005, 2006. So you've got the, you've got um, all those online auctions. You've got the auction house eliminating their departments and just going for contemporary art. So suddenly maps will come up in a travel sale or they'll come up in maybe a book sale, but many auction houses got rid of their map specialist department. So that's maybe good for a chance to get a sleeper, right? Something that's yeah. priced wrong at an auction, but it's also, it's bad for the trade because then it's like, what, we're not cool enough because some of our maps only sell for a hundred thousand. Whereas well, you look, look at the prices for contemporary art. They don't even care if it's, unless it's a million, you know? Yeah. So, so it's, that's what it, it's sort of, um, you know, bordering on collectibles, but maybe not, you know, not the big, big money, but that makes it fun for new collectors. Yeah. You can play something for $2,000. The reason that these auction houses dropped their, their map departments was because of the proliferation of these other sites. And that kind of dropped the value a lot is what you're saying. Like as these other sites came up, the things became less rare value, the valuations came down and the auctions just didn't, the auction houses just didn't evaluate the same way. Well, partly, but more more importantly, is the rise of the power of the contemporary art collector okay. and the giant numbers they were getting. So it was a shift in in not in taste, but in yeah, like it was just it became like more it, people were more interested in in seeing these big numbers and maybe trying to make money off that. Yeah. Whereas people that buy maps, there tend to be collectors of objects. They're not interested in flipping. They want it to keep it. That's kind of what, what makes it so nice is they're not they're not sitting there turn flipping it. Yeah. They're investing protecting it and and maybe with the hopes of having it head to an institution, not like just reselling it. You know, so that's what working with map collectors is so rewarding for as a dealer because they truly, truly love it. They yeah. love it too much, you know, and, and, and that's what I think is, is special about our industry too. There's not as much flipping going on, but having said that, you know, I'm into the fractionalizing. I think that's a cool project, <laughs> um, you know, because um, we, we talked about that earlier, like the idea of community, of communally owning something and caring for it, caring for actually physically taking care of it and then guarding the price keeping yeah. the price uh, you know maybe a little higher for for investment reasons i don't i don't see anything wrong with that so then um i'm wondering you know would there be something lost like there's there are things that just get popped up and we call it like influencers or people that really uh make the market right and so before you know it you'll have different asset classes coming up because certain people said, Hey, this, this is cool. This is valuable. And I'm buying these. And then people follow them. Is, and you mentioned that the map map industry isn't really like that. Do you think that it could benefit from that? And, and, and how do you view maps? You know, these historical artifacts, these items that, you know, can tell so much, how do you view them as potential investments? Like alternative investments is what we call them. Hmm. I mean, that's a good question. I think that it, it, um, it what's, the classics, like the, the in, in terms of an asset, something that's always good. People want to know, is, is it going to hold its value? Is right. this, going to be, am I going to be able to resell it? And, and it's, if you, if you want to bring it down to basics, it, it's something that's, that's big and beautiful will always sell. And, you know, for, for us in the map market, we're look, we're always looking at regions, trends, globalization, right? So, so for example, you know, what's happening with like, who, who, who are the collectors? And like I mentioned Abu Dhabi, like the, the move opening a branch in Abu Dhabi. So mm -hmm. suddenly they, they're, they're looking for material that relates to that part of the world. Right. So that's the driving factor. Um, and then, you know, talking about, you know, a map isn't where the message isn't geography, it's beauty, like the Turgo map of Paris, that's always twenty twenty five thousand dollars and and it's Paris, it's stunning, right? And then, and, you know, for us, we, one of my um, favorite maps of New York City is called the Vili map. And it was printed in 1865. It's big, it's about five feet. And it's it's a technical map. It's 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 beautiful because it's watercolored, but um, Vili Egbert Vili made the map because it was it, New York City was in the middle of a huge change. They were it was just after 
the Civil War and everyone was moving to New York City. So what it was, was the end of nature and the beginning of culture, right? They're starting to grade the city, they're building streets, they're filling in lakes, they're, they're, they're changing New York. The New York is becoming what it is today. So it's a classic map and it's always been beloved. It's always been available but right now there aren't any and and during the pandemic i had a, a client of mine several of my clients left new york they gave up their pied a terres and they they left the city and um i was lucky enough to get a call from a client and he said you know i do you want to buy back my veely i dropped everything i went over there with cash i i said i'll, I'll buy your veely i you know it was at a time when when there was no one in the streets of new york and i i met i went it was like you know i came there i went there with the cash and I grabbed the map and I, I managed to get an Uber and I, I got them. I, I sold it within an hour. Wow. And it was, um, what's funny is that the, uh, a few months ago, the client called and he said, do you still have it? I, I'm really, really upset. I sold it. I regret it. And, and so I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I sold it. And he said, please, can you contact him? I'll pay anything for it to get it back wow. and I called the guy, the guy I sold it to and he said I will never sell this map so it's kind of fun to have that kind of mystique around a map it's just a map of New York City but yeah. these are where you know everyone loves Paris everyone loves New York and yeah. and it, that's where the city plan reigns large there's a there's a a beautiful there's the first map ever printed of amsterdam which is another beautiful city with the grand canal and the circular format of it it's gorgeous it always looks good on the plan but the the one of the first ones was i think in like 1550 and it was by and Anthony's a Dutch map maker and you know that sells for you know 400 like 400,000 euros or more if you can wow. buy one you know, so it's yeah. sort of these things that that so asset class like or or I don't know. I mean, I I certainly and you know Amsterdam represents so much like it, and especially for New York City collectors, yeah. the reciprocity between the two cities and Henry Hudson looking for the Northwest Passage and he finds what does he find? He finds New York City and Beavers. You know what I mean? Like it's just yeah. has a lot of there's a lot of connections and I think it, you know there is like that you know. So do you do you like it because you um, because it, it's so valuable or because it's beautiful? I think yeah. both. You know, city plans never go to fashion. That that's awesome. And and going back to that map, it sounds like you already have a buyer waiting. For you. If you can ever find another copy of that map, the New York City map. I have a waiting list. I, I have a waiting list for people who want it. Wow. And it's it's you know it's just one of these things that speaks to everyone. It speaks to people that do GIS because of the data. Mm -hmm. It speaks to artists because of the watercolor. It speaks to like New York City lovers because of it's so detailed. And everyone said it's so accurate that engineers still use it today, right? Yeah. They use a digital version to say, wait, where I'm building is there a river underground here that 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 was filled in? And yeah. and <laughs> so it's sort of it speaks to every type of map collector. Right. Yes. From from people who generate maps today to, you know, so the, I think there's many, many examples of that that could be asset class. I don't know. It's we don't use those words in, in the map world, but I think we could. Why not? Yeah. You know, Laura, I, I've learned so much. Uh, just your your whole just listening to you and the stories are, are fantastic. I want to respect your time before I do that. I know I sent you some um, I sent you this this uh, uh, a map and it's going to be. Um, Yes. Uh, fractionalized at, at, a, at, a, at a date to be determined, um, but it's a 1796 plan for New York City, and uh, you are an appraiser. You, you've been on the Antiques Roadshow several times. You are widely recognized as, as, a, as a top expert, and I was just wondering if you would be willing to kind of go over this map for our listeners and just kind of talk about its history, and maybe at the end, if, if, you, if you're okay with it, like giving some sort of a, you know, an appraisal for it. Well, um, I can I can certainly talk about that map, and I, I can tell you that it is not only is it rare, mm -hmm. um, and and it's rare because um, back then so the, there were no like so 18th century, so it's the it's after the revolution, but it's not at a point when there are materials are available. So so to generate a map like that, like in England, is easier, but to generate something like that 
here is is very difficult and then also to generate something that is true that is accurate it's not imagined it's not like projected it's not based on other maps it's a true map of like what new york looked like after the revolution which was you know it needed rebuilding as far as i've read it's like you know it's it was a very important time for as you're, new york. As you're talking i'm looking at it so yeah <laughs> I wish I had it in front of me. I love that map. And, and it's kind of, I mean, they call it the Maverick, which is cool because Maverick, it, you know, the printer, but it was also, you know, I think the map maker is, is um, he doesn't even sign it. Like it just says the initials on it, mm -hmm. right? J-A. And um, it, it's it's something that, you know, I've, I've certainly never seen one in person. I've only read about it. Yeah. And that makes me excited, you know, and, and it's not a big map and it's not necessarily pretty, but it's so early and it's of our beloved city. And so because there were, it's not known how many were printed mm -hmm. and it's certainly not known how many in circulation. So that means there are very few, like under, under 10. How many institution copies are there? These are like I talked about the three methods we use. Like when I'm on the Antiques Roadshow, I can't just throw out a number. I have to legitimize my research or my, not even research, because you don't have time, you just have to say it. But um, I have to legitimize my price and I do that and even when I do an appraisal for someone um, that you know for the appraisers um, or for you know say they're donating or for tax reasons I have to be able to stand behind my price and so I do that through these those three methods the retail price the auction price and then the number of institutional copies that's all you can do and then you have to make it up so I, I'm certainly not going to go out on a limb and put a number on your map, okay. but I, cause I can't, but and it's just too much. And then also I charge a lot of money for appraisals. Okay. okay. If anyone wants to know, <laughs> but I can tell you that in terms of your vision of fractionalizing it, I think it's a great idea because pretty much we know, we know there's very few mm -hmm. and know that you can cut once, once that happens, you can kind of go anywhere you want with the price. Yeah. And, and that's what makes it fun. Like I would, you know, and I, so I think it becomes above art, if I can say that, because it's so specific piece of history for one of the greatest cities in the world at yeah. one of the important times in the freshly built country. <laughs> so that makes it exciting. And, and, you know, and uh, that's all I can say about it. Absolutely. Uh, so, so that's, yeah. And that, that's the map that's going to be uh, fractionalized by rally at some point in time. And uh, it, it just, it kind of made a little bit of a splash because it was like, Oh, a new, a completely new, like we said, asset class, like they had never done a map before. So it was just exciting, you know, and, and, and we're, people are kind of wondering, well, what is this, you know, and how do we, what do we make of it? So, uh, but like you said, yeah, it definitely it's just got lower Manhattan kind of starting to be developed. Yeah, I think it's a great idea for, for that piece because it's so rare that it, it, it can bring, it can, you can kind of invent it. You can turn, in, turn it into whatever you want. There's no equivalent, you know, right. which is really nice. And, um, and it's fun. And it's, I'd like to talk about that idea of sort of dealers doing that together. Why not everybody else? That's the whole NFT thing, right? It's like, we can all get in there and we can do a little bit of it. And mm -hmm. I think that's fun. And, and maps should be included in that world. Absolutely. Laura, thank you so much for your time. If anybody okay. wants to get in touch with you, what would be the best way to do that? You know, in terms of oh, learning more about maps, using your bookstore. Yeah. My email at the store is just gallery at argosybooks.com. And I'm here all the time and I have a beautiful gallery and it's full of maps. And I'm, uh, you know, I would love for people to visit. And, um, you know, we are, you could also reach me through the New York Map Society. I'm the vice president and it's, uh, we're just maps all day. I can talk about maps for hours if anyone wants to. <laughs> <don't>. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Thank you so much for including me and, and putting maps in the discussion. You know, and, and that's what I'm saying about maps and, and how exciting can, it can be for investing because it's it's in the realm of so many aspects of, of life, book collecting, art collecting, and its own niche. Absolutely. And 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 maybe this also brings brings forth more collectors and more people that are interested in this, you know, um, and something so awesome. In fact, I got into I, I, I bought a, a, an inexpensive $40 map online just because I, I was like, let me do this. You know, I, I started researching. So 
fabulous. Uh, That's it. And you can't, there's things for a hundred bucks, 200 bucks that are really old and special. Yeah. And then your job as a collector is to take care of it. And if you take care of it, the sky's the limit for selling, you know, and that's, that's what we really tell people. You can buy it, make sure it's in the best condition it can be. And who knows what will happen. Awesome. Uh, I could, I could, I could talk more with you, Laura, but you know, for the, for the sake of your time and, and, and the podcast, um, we just want to thank you again. Uh, would look forward to speaking to you at some point in the future as well. And, and thanks for, for taking the time again. <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. Take care. That last bit on the 1796 plan for New York City was truly awesome to hear. It was an expert at work. The entire podcast was like one of those conversations where so much was said and there was so much more we didn't cover. You can tell that Laura is so knowledgeable about maps and loves what she does. She's not just a great go-to person for maps, but also a great spokesperson for collectors everywhere. If you're ever in New York City, make sure to visit the Argosy Bookstore in Manhattan and say hello to Laura. If you enjoyed today's podcast, let others know about it. We find our guests so interesting and knowledgeable and I know others will too, or leave a review or hit the follow button. Until the next episode, take care.